in part 10 of 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22, it seems to me that perhaps last time we passed over too quickly these striking, you might say impossible, commands, always rejoice and in all circumstances give thanks. So let's pick it up here in verse 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always pursue good toward one another and toward everyone. Always rejoice without ceasing, which is another way of saying always. Pray in all circumstances, which is another way of saying always. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, Father, as we spend a few more minutes on always rejoice and in all circumstances give thanks, grant that we would not only have mental categories for understanding what Paul means, but that we would have experiential capacities to actually do this. No matter how we were raised, what families we were in, no matter what our personalities are, work these two miracles, I pray. Pervasive joy, pervasive thankfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the reason we need to linger over this command, rejoice always, is because Sometimes the Bible presents joy and sadness as sequential realities, first one, then the other, and then what becomes of always. If sometimes you are sorrowful and sometimes you're rejoicing, then what does always mean? Let's look at a few of those passages. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So first weeping, and then joy. So how can joy be always if weeping was for the night and joy was only in the morning? Psalm 126, those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. So first the sowing in tears, then the reaping with joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy bringing his sheaves with him. So what does Paul mean then when he says, rejoice always, if texts like that imply joy and sorrow are sequential and not simultaneous? Well, I don't think those texts do imply that the only experience of joy and sorrow is sequential. I think those texts fit with saying there is an experience of sorrow and joy that are outwardly different and so sequential, but there is an experience of joy that is solid and unshaken and is always there in sorrow. For example, here in Philippians, Paul says, I'm collapsing verse 18 down so that you can see it next to verse 4 of chapter 4. Many of whom I have often told you, and now I tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. A few verses later, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. So here he is weeping, and here he is telling us in the same context that his joy is always. In other words, these tears are, I would say, simultaneous with his joy. And here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 6.10. We are as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Now there he puts the two right together with this yet and tells us 
I experience sorrow and I experience joy at the same time. And you've tasted that. If you're old enough, you have. Remember when my mother was killed, oh, how I wept and wept. I was 28 years old. And all the while that I was weeping at the loss, I was rejoicing that I had her for 28 years, that she was a great mom, that she didn't suffer much, that she was in heaven with Jesus, that my dad had survived the accident. I know it is possible experientially to have joy and sorrow at the same time, not just sequentially. And so I think when Paul says here, always rejoice, he means it. I picture it like a boulder. I can't draw, but I'll, I'll make a big boulder. And here's the cliff and the waves. This is, this is o- ocean right here. And there's a big rock boulder. And this boulder is Christian joy in God. And sometimes the sea is smooth and the, the face of this rock is above the water and shining, and we call that rejoicing as you come home from uh, sowing your seeds in tears. And sometimes the waves are great and go right over the rock, and these waves represent sorrow and tears. And the, the boulder is still there, but it's covered in its manifestation with tears. So if you see a Christian weeping, you shouldn't criticize because you have no idea. It may be very godly weeping, and there may be massive, profound, unshakable joy underneath the weeping. Same thing now with thanks. Give thanks in all circumstances. And you might say, oh, good, I'm glad it didn't say give thanks for all things. Well, in fact, Paul does say that in Ephesians 5. Address one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus. So the always for thanksgiving is not just all circumstances, it is for everything. And I assume then that there is a a dreadful thanks. News that you do not want to get. Horrible, horrible news of tragedy. And you don't want this dreadful news. And you get the news. And thanks to God for whatever he intends to do in and through and with this dreaded tragedy stands. And there's, of course, a dancing. Thanks. No dread at all. Total, toe-tapping gratitude for good things that have happened and rugged, unshakable confidence in the sovereignty of God to turn everything for good and use everything for good and will everything for good, even those things that are dreaded so that there can be an appropriate kind of thanksgiving, very different from this kind in that dreaded event. So, in all circumstances and for all things, There is a kind of thanks, and in all things, for all things, there is a kind of joy. And if that sounds impossible, it is, which is why, wouldn't you agree, we must be praying all the time. What is prayer? Prayer is the heart's statement. This is impossible. This is impossible. I can't do this. I can't do this. And God says, no, you can't. That's why I told you to pray. 
And, and this without ceasing corresponds to this always. This without ceasing corresponds to this all circumstances and all things, because God knows human beings do not have the wherewithal to rejoice always. Human beings in their fallen state don't have the wherewithal to give thanks for everything or in all circumstances. Only God, only God can work that miracle, which is why then it is possible, possible for him to say that we are always doing good to others. In other words, we don't take a break. We don't say, well, I'm, when I'm unhappy, I'll stop doing good to others. And when I'm unthankful, I've stopped doing good to others because there is no time when you are allowed to be without joy, allowed to be without thanks. And therefore, if God would be pleased to work the miracle, this joy and this thanks always give you the resources you need to do the good he calls upon you to do.